This morning, uh, we are continuing, brothers and sisters, our series on Philippians, dwelling with Philippians. Um, and this, uh, this morning, I know it says in the bulletin that we're only looking at verses 5 to 8, but we're actually going to look at verses 5 to 11. So, um, there it is. So, uh, let us first of all go and read in Scripture. Now, now remember that, that Paul, just before this, last week, Paul was pleading with the Philippians for them to be of one mind. If there was any joy in the Gospel, any consolation from Jesus Christ, any uh, love that comes from our relationship with God and with one another, then please, Paul says, please be of one mind. And here today, we are going to see what one mind, right? It's not one mind as we talked about last week. It's not one mind as in we all agree about all the things all the time. It's not uniformity, but rather it is unity and a particular kind of unity that is centered around what Paul is about to say to us. So, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Can you guys read that? Or is it too small? Yeah, that's okay? All right. Uh, for those who can't read it or would rather read in the Pew Bibles, feel free to follow along in that way. Oops. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a lot bigger. All right. Good. So this is what it says. Um, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not, where did you go? There. Consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. A, a couple things. Um, a couple things to note here. Uh, I was looking at a slightly different translation here, as you can see, um, because uh, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. Right? Or as we just read, something to be used for his own advantage. This is really key. Because you notice, right, that we, as we go on, therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. Right? We need to keep in our minds that Jesus did not empty himself, becoming nothing, becoming a slave with a long-term ambition in mind. Right? It's, it's not like he's sitting here, okay, okay, I'll do this, I'll lay everything down, I'll become nothing for a little while, because I know it's going to get me all that I want in the end. Right? That's, that's not how it is. Paul is very clear. He, Jesus was not playing the long game. Jesus was doing what he does in the economy or in the structure of, of the kingdom of heaven, which is an upside down sort of kingdom, where, where, where to be the best means to be slave of all. And, and so Jesus willingly, not because of goals down the road, other than wanting to genuinely serve us and love us and bring us into right relationship with God the Father, Jesus willingly becomes a slave to all. That's the other thing I wanted to note. The, the translation that was up there before said uh, taking the form of a servant. Uh, it, it's maybe better translated taking the form of a slave, right? Um, a, a servant is, is, in the way we think about it, often basically an employee, 
right? You, you, you hire someone, or rather, like if you watch Downton Abbey, right? Uh, the, 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 the servants in the house are paid money, maybe not a lot, but they are paid money, they are given room and board, uh, and they are free in a lot of ways, right? Whereas this is not quite what God is getting at here. A, a slave, he, he gave himself fully and totally to us. Now, now remember, Paul has just been pleading with us <clears throat> that we would be one in mind <clears throat> based on what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And now he is describing what that means. Right? So he's not just, he's not just giving a kind of doxology or praise to Jesus. He is also describing what we ought to be like. Right? So as we go through this, try and remember that this is what God, through Paul, through the words of Scripture, are, are saying to us. That we, though we have been adopted by God into God's family, we should not regard equality with God or power or authority or honor or dominion or whatever. We should not regard those things as something that we should take and use for our own benefit. Exploit them. Right? We're, we're not like, like the, the story of, of the, the kid who, who pretends to be a little lost orphan or something so that they can get into the lives of a, a rich and powerful person and get adopted so that they can become the, the king or something like this. It's not, we're not playing a game either. So we got to remember that as we go along throughout <clears throat> this time. That, that this mind of Christ is what we are to have. <clears throat> Here on the right, uh, there's a, an anonymous sketch, like a sketch done by some anonymous arter, artist ar around the turn of the uh, 18th century, 18th to 19th century, I believe. Um, and uh, it's uh, from the book uh, by Thomas Acampi, uh, which was a book called The Imitation of Christ. You can see that Jesus is pictured there up in the clouds in glory, but then you can see that there are a couple of disciples there carrying their crosses. And, and you can see maybe in the background there are uh, more disciples also carrying their crosses and following Jesus, right? They are seeking to imitate Christ in their life. Now, obviously, they weren't all crucified, but they all sought to live the life of obedience, even obedience unto death, should that be what God calls them to. Listen to this poem by Gracia Grindel from The Joyful Exchange from 2005. Lord, strip my righteousness away and dress me in your grace. For I cannot endure my pride while looking at your face. For when I look upon your face, I feel unclothed and bare. I know that I am dressed in rags and need a robe to wear. The shining robe I need to wear to stand before your throne is woven from the seamless love that took me as your own. In death, you took me as your own. Your rising set me free when you gave up your righteousness to dress and cover me. This is, of course, what Jesus did for us. And it is also what Jesus calls us to do for one another and for the people of this world. Sometimes we have a struggle with scale. We have a trouble. We have trouble with scale. Um, Aaron has these, uh, or 
He doesn't have these videos. He likes these videos from an organization or a group called Kurzgesagt, right? Kind of. Uh, sorry, I messed it up. Kurzgesagt. Anyways, you can find it on YouTube if you can spell it. And if you can't spell it, just try and you'll probably get it anyways. And, and one of these videos is talking about the scale of the universe, right? It, it is talking about zooming in, zooming in, zooming in to the to the microscopic, the tiniest, the elementary particles of this universe, and, and then zooming out, zooming out, zooming out to see the universe in all its size. And, and this is difficult for us. It, it's wonderful because it, it portrays it in, in how long it would take you to walk certain distances and stuff. It's very cool. I would recommend you watch it uh, if you can find it. Anyways, um, <clears throat> we have trouble with scale because we are human and we can only see things from our perspective. We can't really see, not very easily, what it's like to live as an ant or as a bacteria or as a star or as a galaxy. Right? We can't see that. And, and this is true, of course, not only for our universe, but also for the scale of who God is and what God has done. Remember in the beginning of John, what does it say in just the first line or two? Yeah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When we speak about God in Jesus Christ emptying Himself, becoming nothing, we are coming, we are talking about the God who, through whom all things were created and are sustained, the very word of God becoming nothing like us. This painting over on the left is, is entitled, In the Beginning Was the Word. And you, you can see sort of... Um, down here and around the outsides, right? It, it looks like there are words in here, right? And in fact, these words are like Hebrew words. And I, I bet you if we were able to translate them, uh, which I can't do on the fly, I'm sorry, my Hebrew is not that good. Um, if we were able to translate them, would speak about who God is, the names of God and, and what he has done. And, and then um, that, that picture culminates in the creation of light and, and people, right? It's called, uh, appropriately enough, in the beginning was the word. And then pair that with this poem uh, from Herman G. Stumpfli. I think I'm saying that badly, but I don't know how else to say it. Uh, one with God before creation. One with God before creation, bringing stars and suns to birth. Christ, you cast aside your glory as a servant, walked the earth. Let your mind, O Christ, be in us, forming us in all our ways. Let your light and love surround us, guarding, guiding all our days. Emptied now of gain and glory, one with our humanity, and all our pain and grief embracing by your love so full and free. This is a radical kind of emptying for the sake of others. This is not just, oh, I'll be kind and open the door for you because I'm a nice guy. This is the kind of life that says love is worth sacrificing everything for. Love being God, of course, because God is love. This is, this is, this is the love, the, the life that says, if I die in service to God and to my fellow human beings, if I die in that way, Praise God. What a glory. Not, not because I get to be praised, but because God gets to be praised. It's the, the kind of love that says, even if I die a horrifying, lonely death, 
for that cause. Praise be to God. Brothers and sisters, this is the kind of love that we are called to have for one another and called to have for the people around us and called, of course, to have most of all for God. What? Just think, what happens to our disagreements with this kind of love? What happens to our pride with this kind of love? What happens to our, our, our schism in the church? What happens to our relationships with one another with this kind of love? Um, I'm going to, this is risky for me, so I, I was going to sing this for you a cappella, but I chickened out. So Gwyneth is going to help me. And, uh, and, and so part of me really wants you to sing along, <laughs> just for support. But part of me, um, the stronger part, I think, at the moment, wants you to listen. Um, do you need something? Well, I've got three of them here. I don't know why, but I do. So, um, if you if you can, if you're able, uh, either just read along with the with the lyrics on the screen or listen. Uh, try to, of course, dismiss any opportunedness. Sacred head now wounded with grief and shame weighed down, now scornfully surrounded with thorns, your only crown. Oh, sacred head, what glory! And blessing you have known. Yet though despised and gory, I claim you as my own. My Lord, what do you did suffer? Was all for sinners gain. Mine, mine was the transgression, but yours the deadly pain. So here I kneel, my Savior, for I deserve. Your place. Look on me with your favor and save me by your grace. What language shall I borrow to thank you, dearest friend? For this your dying sorrow, your mercy without end. Lord, make me yours forever, a loyal servant true. And let me Never, never outlive my love for you. Thank you. Uh, that was kind. Um, uh, I, I love this song. Um, both both because of, of for, for me, how, how deeply it speaks 
of who God is in Jesus Christ and what God has done for us. O sacred head now wounded, with grief and shame weighed down. But it also speaks to me about who I am, who I am called to be. As Christ laid down so much for me, how could I not at least want to do the same for for him and, and for others? I'm not saying that I'm anywhere near perfect at doing that. But this is, this is what I want. This is what I want, not because I'm some masochist who has a desire to hurt themselves or punish themselves. I I mean, sometimes I wrestle with that, but that's a whole other thing. But but because the person, the being to whom I owe everything, to whom I look up to more than anyone else, the, the, the Lord and Savior of my life has shown me this. And why would I want anything else? Why would I want anything else? So Lord, make me yours forever. A loyal servant And let me never, never outlive my love for you. Brothers and sisters, I talk to to young people over the years. I mean, uh, I've been a minister for 15, almost 15 years now. And and, uh, before that as a teacher and before that as as a youth volunteer and before that, I don't know, whatever. But... But whenever I get the se- whenever I get the chance, I say to young people and to us, don't live a life that is mediocre. Don't live a eh, life. Why would you want that? And and by that I don't I don't mean that you have to like become president of the world or or uh, sheriff of the world uh, or anything like that. I, I'm not I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is. Live a life like this. That's what God has called us to. That's the best there is. It may not seem like it from the world's standpoint, but it is. There is nothing better than being slave to Christ and to people. There's nothing better. We went into town, into town. We went into Toronto this past week uh, I had a conference that I went to for a while. Well, Toronto's a town, sort of. Anyways, we went into town and, and we went to watch the show Hamilton, uh, the musical, um, which was really, really good, by the way. But we went, and we're not used to being around that many people. There were, like, so many people. And at one point, we said to each other, oh, so many people. And, and, and I turned and I shared. I said, yeah, and they're all beautiful image bearers of God. Isn't that cool? I'm not sure we all bought into that, but at least in the moment. But that's, that's what it is. Whether you're in a little tiny village of Athens or whether you're in a city of six million plus people, they're all beautiful. They're all image bearers. They're all worth dying for. They're all worth serving. They are all gods. Not, they are not gods. They are all belonging to God. Sorry. That's what I mean. Right? Um, this is from uh, T.S. Eliot. I don't know. I, I need to read more T.S. Eliot. I haven't re- read enough T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot, um, British fellow, uh, great sort of uh, theologian. I, I think I spelled his name wrong. But anyways, um, we have lost our way in the dark. Listen to his, his, his understanding of our plight as human beings, but also uh, connect that with what God experienced in Jesus Christ on the cross. This, this painting over on the right here is by Kevin Raleigh. 
uh, entitled Forsaken, the Crucifixion. And, and you can see you know, Christ with his arms out as on the cross. And, and you can see, um, you can see the, the light, but also the darkness of feeling completely alone and abandoned. The circle of our understanding, T.S. Eliot says, is a very restricted area. What is happening outside the circle? And what is the meaning of happening? Right? What is being done to us? And what are we? And what are we doing? To each and all of these questions, there is no conceivable answer. We have suffered far more than a personal we have lost our way in the dark. So many people, so many people are so lost. They're lost in the dark. And all of us, all of us can empathize with that because we too have been lost in the dark. And, and we too sometimes still feel lost in the dark even though we know we are not, even though we know that Jesus did that for us, we still feel it. Lost in the dark. Psalm 22. I don't know how often we make this connection, of course, but when Jesus is on the cross and he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthi, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is quoting from Psalm 22. Listen to what, what, what the context of that psalm is. Verses 1 to 8. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but find no rest. How much that captures that, uh, that aloneness, lostness in the dark. Christ is hanging there. And, and he, he not only takes all the burden of all the brokenness and messed upness in our lives, but he can identify with what we are feeling. Lost and alone in the dark. But of course, that's not the end. That's not the end of the psalm. That's not the end of what Jesus is saying. There is more, right? Jesus goes on and he says it is finished. And he has accomplished things. He rises from the dead, conquering sin and death because death cannot hold him, right? And so the psalm goes on to, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. The psalmist clings to the hope of what God has done. But, but his trouble is, is lurking over him. And so we hear him go back. But I am a worm. And not scorned by others and despised by the people. All who seek, see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Huh. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let Him deliver. Let Him rescue the one in whom He delights. Of course, we can see this happening as Jesus is on the cross and the soldiers and the other the other thief who, or the other criminal on the cross, the, not the thief who, who repented, but the other one, and, and the Pharisees and Sadducees who are passing by, they, they are saying these things to him. They're saying, oh yeah, if you're so special, if God loves you so much, then why doesn't He pull you down off the cross? And yet, Jesus in His love for God and His obedience to God and in His love for us does not come off the, 
the cross in wrath and fury, smiting his enemies. Instead, he learns obedience even unto death on the cross. We're going to sing this um, as our song of response in, in a few moments here. But just want you to, before we sing it, um, think about these lyrics. Hear these lyrics, right? This is our God. This is Jesus Christ. And, you know, described in this music by Graham Kendrick. But, but also then it is who we are. Who we are called to be. Who we are in Christ Jesus. Who we are through the power of the Holy Spirit. Meekness and majesty. Manhood and deity in perfect harmony, the man who is God, Lord of eternity, dwells in humanity, kneels in humility, and washes our feet. Oh, what a mystery. Meekness and majesty, bow down and worship, for this is your God. Fathers, pure radiance, perfect in innocence, yet learns obedience to death on a cross, suffering to give us life, conquering through sacrifice. And as they crucify, praise, Father, forgive. Wisdom unsearchable, God the invisible, love indestructible in frailty appears. Lord of infinity, stooping so tenderly, lifts our humanity to the heights of his throne. Brothers and sisters, being of one mind, being of the mind of Christ, is no small thing. And, and God has gifted us, gifted you, gifted us in so many ways. But we are only just beginning. The journey of love is an eternal one. One where we will learn more and more and more the height and the width and the depth and the breadth of God's love for us. And we will learn more and more how to live in that love, in that truth, in that sacrifice, in that reality for him and for one another and for this world. Embrace the journey, brothers and sisters. Let's live a life that is far from mediocre. Let's pray. Oh God, thank you so very, very much for your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to be with us to show us what it means to be human in the way that you meant for us to be. But not only that, does so in a way that combines that demonstration with such profound impact on our lives. Lord, we were truly, apart from you, worms, nothing. But with you, O oh God, with you and because of your Son and through the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, we stand as more than conquerors. Not, not more than conquerors in the earthly sense, but more than conquerors in the Jesus sense. Your victory was a service to us. Our victory is grateful service in response to your saving grace in Jesus Christ. May we love you. May we love each other. May we love the people of this world. And may we do so in the upside-down kingdom way that you showed us Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.